started. It's a fairly busy lecture today, so let's try to stay on time. Um, so I'm going to start off by reviewing a uh, class from last time. Actually, so I really know. How many people were able to view the video since last time? Uh, since last week, I mean? So about maybe half? OK. All right, well, please take a look if you haven't already. I'll review a little, little bit of it now, but um, you should look at the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> and then the main topic for today is, is address translation. <clears throat> and we'll be t talking about this for actually two lectures. Um, and we'll cover some of the basic methods this time um, and get into more advanced topics next time. So address translation is going from the, each process's virtual view of memory to the physical memory. So and we'll be covering those topics, uh, segmentation, you know, how the um, different areas of memory in each process are handled and maintained separate um, paging, which is how virtual blocks are mapped to physical blocks in manageable size chunks. Um, more advanced translation from virtual to physical addresses uh, for higher efficiency and to deal with really large address spaces like 64-bit address spaces. Um, and then actually page, page tables. Um, another more advanced idea in inverted page tables which are uh, on the IA64 architecture. So here's the link to the YouTube uh, video. You don't have to transcribe this. It's uh, near the top of the class homepage right now. <clears throat> and there's also a link in Piazza. Okay, so, but please take a look. All right, so um, in that last lecture, we were looking at scheduling. <clears throat> uh, the two different schemes, uh, first come, first served, and it was sometimes called FIFO. I think it's equivalent to FIFO. Uh, and the other one is round robin. <clears throat> so uh, first come, first served means simply that a process comes in, it goes into a queue. Uh, when resources are available, it runs to conclusion. In round robin, there are time slices of some size uh, allocated in turn to the waiting processes. And once every process has had a slice in the ready queue, uh, if they're not finished, you go around again. And that's the reason for the name round robin. All right, and so uh, let's quickly look at an example of that. Even if you haven't seen this, this is probably going to be fairly intuitive. Um, so imagine we have 10 jobs. <clears throat> Each of them is taking a, a hundreds of seconds of CPU time. And we have a, a round robin scheduler with a quantum of one second. So it's allocating chunks of one second in this round robin fashion to each of the ready jobs. Um, the first come, first serve doesn't have any parameters. It just runs every job uh, to completion. So there's no need to describe it with parameters. <clears throat> and so if we just numbered the jobs in the order in the queue P1 through P10, um, if each one's taking hundreds of seconds, uh, you, you'll get this plot here with each job basically taking up a massive chunk of CPU time and then stopping. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and that contrasts with the round robin approach where uh, each process gets a little slice. You have to context switch each time, give each process uh, a little bit of time. And once you've gone through all of them, you start again. So you go through the 10 processes here. Um, after 10 seconds, each one's had one slice of one second. So you start again. And so it's very fair. And it has some advantages, although this example is not very favorable to round robin. So it was presented last time. Yeah? That's, the amount of, that's just the amount of time that round robin is assigning. So round robin you know, assigns a chunk of time and then interrupts the process. So it's just how long each process gets to run without being interrupted. Um, <clears throat> all right, so, all right, and, and so you notice with round robin, uh, the processes are actually not finishing until the last phase. If they're all exactly a hundred seconds, then they won't finish until this last phase. So uh, essentially, all the processes spent around about a thousand seconds, 900 to a thousand seconds. Actually, between 990 and 
a thousand. So uh, here we're showing the completion time for each job. And first come, first served, you know, it's just the point where the job finishes. So it's 100, 200 through 1,000. Uh, and then round robin, because they're all finishing in that very last chunk, uh, is between 990 and 1,000. So what are the, how do the average completion times compare? What's the average of these numbers here? What's that? Five. Yeah, five, okay, 550. Yeah, very good. And what about for round robin? 995, near enough, yeah, right. So about twice as fast. Uh, if in this case, the first come, first served is, um, is about twice as fast. This case is a bit a atypical, though. Um, okay, what's unusual about this example? Yeah, you saw some other ones. If you saw the lecture, you saw probably different behavior with different examples, yeah. Right. So what happens if they don't? What if you have, say, lots of short jobs? Yeah, round robin's generally going to do a lot better because um, if a job takes five seconds, it's going to be done after about 50 seconds. Right? Or if it takes 10 seconds, it's going to be done after 100 seconds. Um, in round robin format. If it's in uh, first come, first served, it's just anybody's guess when it finishes. It's just the, well, actually, you, you, this is almost a universal result, right? Um, if you have any number of jobs whose total running time is 1,000 seconds, roughly speaking, the expected completion time uh, is going to be about this. Um, certainly, if the ordering is random, that's going to be your expected completion time. So um, first come, first serve is pretty consistent, uh, at least with random ordering. Round robin, though, generally will give you um, a completion time that's proportional. It is proportional to the running time of the job. And so when you have short jobs, the short jobs will finish soon. So it's generally better for uh, uh, realistic examples, because realistic cases, you typically have a lot generally more short jobs than long jobs. All right. <clears throat> so this is just reinforcing that. Um, yeah, so we saw a worse time with Rand Robin in this special case with all jobs the same length. But generally, it does a lot better when you have many short jobs, because the short jobs finish quickly. Um, on the other hand, uh, some disadvantages of, of Rand Robin are that because there's a lot more context switching, uh, you, there's overhead in associated with the context switches, but also there's generally um, uh, additional overhead because of cache loading. The caches have to work harder because they're serving ten, effectively 10 different processes at once versus serving just one process, essentially being able to clear everything when the next job starts and have that each job only have to uh, load its own values into cache. So typically, um, round robin, if it's memory intensive jobs, round robin is maybe not such a good uh, strategy. All right, but it is the preferred strategy these days. Among other things, it gives you uh, real time experiences for users for processes that involve some interaction. Yeah. So, so what's the percentage of time involved in the context switch compared to, to the quantum, do you mean? Well, uh, as best I can determine, the, the context switching time now is uh, it's around three to four microseconds. The TLB flushing, which we'll talk about next time, is around five microseconds. So even fairly expensive um, context switches at the machine level are pretty fast these days. And Typical machines like Windows is doing probably thousands of context switches a second. Um, so at, at a few microseconds each, that's maybe a percent or a few percent overhead for the context switches, something like that. All right, uh, okay, so um, 
<clears throat> the schemes we talked about so far are oblivious to uh, knowledge of how long the job is going to take. There was another approach that was described, which is called shortest remaining time first. Uh, if somehow you have advanced knowledge of how long the job's going to run, the smart way to schedule is to s schedule jobs that are going to finish soon at the front, do them first. So that's exactly what this heuristic is. If you can determine how long a job is going to take to run, you just push jobs with the shortest remaining time to the front of the queue. Um, <clears throat> so, all right, so uh, <clears throat> if you imagine we have three jobs, uh, one of the two of which, excuse me, A and B are CPU bound, so they're going to run a long computation, um, not yield the CPU, just go for an incredibly long time versus um, an I.O. bound job <clears throat> that's alternating between, uh, what is it, a millisecond of CPU and nine milliseconds of I.O. Then, you know, A and B, typically when you let it run by itself, it looks like that. Uh, C has this pattern alternating between disk and CPU. Um, in fact, in a lot of operating systems, uh, C can actually overlap its CPU, depending on the dependencies. Uh, but you'll often be able to overlap the CPU with its I.O. Certainly when you start, start scheduling other jobs, they can overlap their CPU use with um, job C's I.O. <coughs> All right, so when C is running, it's doing these nine millisecond slices of disk and then one, one millisecond of CPU. So it's using 90% of the disk, which is desirable if it's if it's disk intensive, that's good. Um, and A and B use 100% of the CPU, which is fine if they're CPU intensive. All right. Um, <clears throat> but when we try, start trying to schedule them, uh, clearly somebody loses because A and B, once they get in, in a pure first come, first serve strategy, they're just there until they run out. So that's poor job C doesn't get a chance to run. <clears throat> um, let's look at uh, the round robin scheme, which is, was really the best one we've seen so far, and then compare it with the shortest remaining time for a strategy on a timeline. So one, one clarifying remark I'm going to make is that we're going to assume C is actually, uh, the reason it simply doesn't say spends 90% of the time on disk and 10% uh, on CPU is that it's actually in these explicit slices. So we're assuming at the end of a slice it's going to yield the CPU. So in fact, CPU C is going to do little bursts and then give up uh, control to the scheduler and other jobs will be able to run. Presumably because C can't really do anything until it gets its net disk I.O. Um, so, <clears throat> so here's round robin. Um, with a 100 millisecond time slice. Oops, I should grab my... All right. <clears throat> All right, so uh, C... <clears throat> Starts off, let's assume it starts off by doing I.O. And um, because it's going to yield the processor, it's going to do its, its I.O. And then um, maybe use a little bit of CPU, actually, I guess uh, it hardly matters. It's uh, only a millisecond of CPU. So basically, A runs its uh, CPU task, and then B runs and then we're back, it's round robin, so uh, C might start again. All right, is that clear? So there's nine milliseconds of, um, of I.O., one millisecond of CPU in there somewhere, can't really see it, um, and then 100 milliseconds of CPU for A. Is that clear? So um, we're not getting, C's not doing very well. Um, uh, let's see, yeah, it's, it's running for nine milliseconds, which is its, its quantum. Uh, these 
A and B jobs are being scheduled for the full 100 milliseconds. So it's only about 9 milliseconds of disk I.O. out of 201. So we're again assuming that the disk I.O. is being overlapped with the CPU. So there's a total of 201 time slices because it's 1 plus 2 plus 100 plus 100 chunks of CPU and then just 9, chunks, nine milliseconds of disk. So it's about a 4.5% utilization of the disk. Okay. Um, so because um, job C is sort of working in these small chunks, it's going to do a lot better if we use round robin with a, a small time slice, like one millisecond. And it's also more realistic uh, in a real operating system that's trying to be responsive to the user. Um, and so what's happening in here is that there's... Um, pretty hard to see, uh, little chunks of one millisecond of CPU happening in here. And uh, we're going C, A, B, A, B. Uh, the C CPU isn't running right away because it's interleaved with its I.O. So C does a millisecond of CPU, then it has to do nine milliseconds of I.O. And then it can run again. So yeah, so you can see this roughly nine milliseconds here. So the disk is actually working pretty hard, which is good. And the CPUs are actually working reasonably well as well. So this is a much better regimen. It's, it's, C is doing fine now. It's actually fully utilizing its disk, really. Um, and you can see also uh, jobs A and B are running at close to 50% utilization of the CPU, which is what they had in the original scheme as well. So this is doing very well. The downside is that you do have those additional context switches. At one millisecond, that's a thousand context switches a second. Not too bad, not too big a problem these days though. In fact, not, not really atypical. <clears throat> All right, but finally, um, uh, the shortest remaining time to finish is going to um, basically give the same utilization to uh, the jobs, but give them larger time slices. So C is going to do a, a little remaining chunk. Um, a gets a, uh, a reasonable chunk of time. I think it's about 10 milliseconds here. And then, I'm not sure why A is running. Probably should be B there. But anyway, you get larger chunks because the time to finish for A, because it's got a fixed horizon, it's decreasing. And normally, yeah, this one might need a little edit, but normally if you take a chunk away from A, actually, no, I'm sorry, I see why it's done. Sorry, I mean, A is, um, once we take a slice out of A, it's beca it becomes the shortest job to run, so that's actually correct. A should be the next one to run. So, um, yeah, if it runs for 10, milli excuse me, 10 milliseconds, it's become shorter than B, even if they started out the same, so it's gonna tend to run A. Um, in a block. All right. So we still have disk utilization, um, but fewer context switches. All right. So it's sort of a more similar to um, the uh, original uh, first come, first serve. So it's reducing the amount of, of wake ups at the expense of perhaps uh, favoring one of the jobs. So in this case, it's favoring A. All right, so um, some downsides of this shortest remaining time to finish. Um, you can show that it's giving you, okay, one, one thing I'm should've, I should have said, I'm sorry I didn't clarify. The advantage of, um, of this scheme over round robin is like the previous slide, which is if we do this, if we run A to completion first, uh, job A then has a nice fast completion time. Uh, job B has a slower completion time, but the average completion time um, is much better than for round robin. So for round robin, the completion time of A and B is near the end. If, on the other hand, though, um, we let B finish, we let A finish first, we get a lower average completion time. So SRTF turns out to be provably optimal in terms of minimizing the expected completion time. Yeah, question. 
Well, we haven't really clarified what the remaining time to finish is for C, so uh, it's a little tricky. Um, yeah, presumably what's going to happen, actually, the way it's shown here, we can infer, because, because um, A is running now, it should run to completion. Because once you start decreasing its time, if it's already has the shortest time to completion, actually now I'm confused because C, oh no, I'm sorry, G, uh, C may have a lower time to completion, that's probably what's going on here. But uh, it can't run um, until its I.O. is complete. So that's presumably why C is probably able to be scheduled, but it can't be scheduled except from, from uh, when it's basically ready to run. So we can infer that from this that C probably has, C must have the shorter time to completion then A, then B. Does that make sense? I think that's why they're, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, so, so um, yeah, so the question is, does C know that it has the shortest time to finish? So uh, there's, this is a, a hypothetical algorithm that uh, is discussed last time. So I'm only giving you one data point from last time's lecture. Um, there's a variety of heuristics for actually trying to estimate for a specific uh, piece of code how long it is it remains to finish. So we're, we're talking really, um, we're first of all looking at the operating system's view of these processes. Not the operating system may or may not be asking the processes, how long do you have to finish? And the process itself may not know how long it has to finish. That's really a policy decision. Um, we're assuming here that we have some kind of oracle, not necessarily coming from the job that's telling us this job has this much time to, to remaining to finish. If, it, if we knew that somehow, then this is what we should do for scheduling. Um, in practice, to make it work, we employ um, things like the history of that particular program. Um, we might also look at its current running profile. You know, a job that's run for a long time normally has a long time to run. Just a statistical fact. So um, anyway, so no, this is just dealing with the case that we somehow know what's going to happen. All right. So. Um, so some trade-offs with uh, the shortest remaining time to finish is that uh, if you have uh, many of these small jobs, they're going to jump in front of uh, everybody else, longer running jobs. And if there's a stream of those arriving into the scheduler, then, then the longer jobs will never get a chance to run. Um, <coughs> paradoxically, the average uh, completion time will be good because every job that completes will complete fast. Trouble is that some long ones will not, which is almost the reason that this, uh, this desirable property sort of turns against you because you're almost like avoiding the jobs that will mess up your uh, performance. All right, so anyway, large, one, large jobs um, don't get a chance to run. Oops. All right. Um, <coughs> And the other big downside is that somehow we're assuming knowledge of the future. So, uh, you know, you can ask the job or uh, you can look how, job, how long the job's been waiting. There's various heuristics. Um, let's not get into that right now. Um, okay. So it does happen to be better if you have perfect knowledge, though. It happens to be provably optimal if you have perfect knowledge of how long the job's going to take. Um, yeah, and it has this unfairness property, which is it's, it may not allocate any resources to long-running jobs. Okay, so let's move on. The main topic for today uh, is memory mapping. <coughs> and we have to map memory most, uh, in most cases these days because we have a process abstraction. And processes have their own monopolistic view of the machine which includes their own copy of its memory address space. Um, and we talked before, so we just finished talking, in fact, about sharing the CPU. That's a scheduling problem. And today we're going to talk about sharing memory, which is the multiplexing and mapping problem. All right, well, it, there's a bunch of reasons we need to multiplex memory. Uh, you know, again, the main reason is that we give the 
process of view that it owns everything. And clearly, in reality, processes are sharing memory, and typically several of them are running at the same time. So they can't all sh own everything. Somehow we have to produce some kind of mapping from what they see to the physical memory in the machine in some way that um, both provides access to what they need, but also pr protects each other from bad accesses and protects the kernel from somebody doing the wrong thing also. <coughs> so, yeah, so we can't let everybody use everything. We have to somehow divide things up. All right. Um, all right, so here's some desiderata for the memory mapping task. We occasionally do want to allow overlap. Um, so for instance, when you want tasks to share, say, different uh, processes may share the same piece of code. Um, they may share the same piece of, of constant data. And the rest of the time, though, you want each process to have its own memory for anything that, that it's doing um, related to its own state or its own calculations. Those should be separate from the other processes if you want it to be correct. So, so mostly separated access, but not completely. And along with the separation is that if you, uh, if something goes wrong and a, a bad piece of code tries to access something that's outside of the valid addressable range of some process, it shouldn't be able to. That's most likely to be somebody else's data or worse still their code. So you don't want to be able to write to that. And you typically don't want to read it either because it could be secure, it could be sensitive information. So um, typically along with the mapping are some bits <coughs> associated with each area of memory that say not just uh, that this belongs to this particular process, but also it's okay to read it. This process can read that data. This process can write to that data. Um, sometimes there's bits that say this is code versus data and so on. Uh, and sometimes there's bits that say this should only be accessible by the kernel. All right, yeah. So protection's intimately tied up with mapping. And necessarily, um, because different processes have a monopolistic view, um, they can't have unique distinct addresses that would require them to know about each other. So in, you have a simpler problem where um, when you design and program a process, its view of memory is as though uh, it was the only process <coughs> in memory and you allow it to access anything, let's say that's not kernel memory, so that, that when you take those addresses that it's using for its own use, its own sort of individual worldview addresses, you have to map them to physical addresses in such a way that they don't collide with some other processes. And, um, <coughs> all right, we'll look at this a couple of different ways. So from the process's point of view, um, let's say it, it's trying to access some data somewhere. This is a location in memory that's symbolic in assembly language. And there's just some data there, constant data. <coughs> then, this instruction here, so I guess load word into R1, um, it has a, a physical address. Typically, that's a, a word address. So that when um, you translate into a memory address, which is usually a byte address, there's normally some shifting going along. So if we have <coughs> four byte words, the original address in uh, hex is this. Um, 0C0, zero zero, you've got to multiply that by 4. Here it's actually in binary, so multiplying it by 4 is just shifting it left. And it ends up <coughs> as 0x300 there. And so we've basically taken the symbolic address from over here, data 1, uh, and translated it into an absolute addressing memory instruction. So if, we, if this was the only process running, such as if it were a DOS process, uh, and it really did have a direct addressing into memory, uh, you would 
address this 0x300 virtual address directly into 0x300 physical. Now, it, in DOS it works because that's going to be the, normally the only process running. Unfortunately, <coughs> in uh, any other operating system, there may be an app that's already using the, those addresses. You're not going to know until your process starts. So, um, then the task is when we, we'd like to create a unique address for this somehow. Somehow fix the address, uh, and in fact all addresses in the program, so that they point to some area of memory that we really can address. So um, here, let's say we have uh, an available block of memory here, starting at 0x1300, then we can uh, correct that instruction address, and we'll be able to correctly address this memory here. And that requires us to go through, make a pass through the code, and basically relocate uh, all of the addresses. <coughs> and it's a different translation depending on the block that we're targeting. So, yeah, this in fact does happen. Um, and it can happen in different times. I mean, the worst way to do it is at compile time, because that does require you to know ahead of time uh, where every block of code is going to be sitting in memory when they're loaded. Again, that's uh, more of a DOS thing. Um, realistically, though, uh, it's a lot more useful if the uh, piece of code is dynamically linked or if it's just being loaded as a process after all the other processes are loaded. Um, by the time you're ready to load it into memory and, and run it, you know where it's going to go in memory. And so by that time, uh, you can do this kind of translation, just typically adding an offset to the, all of the uh, addresses in the assembly code that correspond to memory addresses. They're normally marked as such, so um, when that's true, that, that code is called relocatable code, and it can be moved around. All right, so any questions? Okay, so um, let's look at, at in a bit more detail of the process of actually getting a program from source code um, compiled, linked, and loaded into memory. So uh, the first stage is the compiler, <coughs> uh, such as GCC, and um, it produces an output which is uh, typically a, a form of assembly code with relocation instructions in it, or relocation annotations in it. Um, and then at linking uh, slash load time, different modules are glued together and their addresses are resolved. So the difference between linking and loading, <laughs> so GCC compiles, you get an object model module. For different source programs, you get other object models, modules, excuse me. Um, the linker <coughs> takes all the pieces of object code and normally assembles them into a single block of code, and in doing so, it does resolve the um, function calls and uh, address, uh, accesses to shared uh, constant memory locations, or I guess shared uh, heap allocated variable. Those all have to get resolved in linkage. Finally, um, this linked piece of code, though, it still uh, has to be relocated. So the linkage editor produces a program with all the modules correctly linked together, uh, but still those addresses, it's not going to know where it's going to run into memory. So when you load it, when you pull it into memory, there's a final stage of uh, relocation potentially. Uh, usually there's some relocation necessary even for position independent code. Um, but finally, anyway, so this, this code is loaded in, uh, and the last step is that it gets linked with dynamically loaded libraries. So dynamically loaded libraries, um, uh, the code that's loaded into memory has to be able to access those. Those have typically been loaded already, um, or they're not loaded yet. So this loading process for your main binary does relocate the memory into the block, 
but these other dynamic li linked libraries are typically in different blocks of memory. So that's the final stage of, of loading, and that involves typically little pieces of stub code in your main program that basically run and check, first of all, <clears throat> is this shared library currently loaded? If so, where is it? It'll communicate with the operating system, find out what modules are loaded, what address, what's their base address. Once it does that, it typically replaces the stub code um, with a simple uh, indirect instruction that allows you to go directly to the functions in the shared library. So um, the effect is finally that you have one piece of code with correct uh, link, jump, and branch instructions within itself and also correct branch and jump instructions into the shared library code so that things go fast. There's not much, there's perhaps just one level of memory indirection uh, to call the shared libraries relative to its statically linked libraries. But once that's all done, then the, the code runs more or less in the same way as though you produced a massive binary from scratch. Okay, any questions? All right, so, uh, so that's the sort of, uh, I suppose, <coughs> offline um, memory translation process that happens, code translation process. But it's still not enough. Um, and the reason is that once you load processes into memory, there's a continuing scheduling process that's happening, which means other processes are being pulled into memory, and your process is, is occasionally being um, scheduled out and then back in. And you don't know what other um, processes might try to use physical addresses of memory that correspond to the addresses that you want to use. So we have to have, in addition to uh, methods of relocating code so that it looks like a single binary memory, we also need methods of m giving each piece of code that's running, each process, um, a, a solipsistic or you know, egocentric view of memory. So that's what e address translation is about. So for each of the two processes here, we have some code, code block data, um, and heap and stack blocks of data. <clears throat> and here's physical memory. And physical memory has to host um, code, data, heap, and stack for two processes, and usually more. And you have to, in fact, also allow some of these to grow. But for right now, um, there's some physical layout of these things. They don't have to be contigu contiguous. They don't have to have the same order as the original ones. But they do have to be somewhere uh, mapped into some block of the same size as the processes view. Um, <clears throat> each process should only know about its own uh, blocks of, of storage. It shouldn't know about what's going on here. So these translation maps um, <coughs> provide a complete view, but a, dis a distinct view for each process. Okay. Now, <coughs> to make that translation process very fast and transparent to the code, you have to use hardware. So it relies on a memory management unit, um, and those have been part of computer hardware for many decades, certainly well beyond MIPS processors. And once you have a memory uh, management unit, there, there's a clear distinction between the CPU's addresses, the ones appearing in CPU instructions, which are called virtual or logical addresses, and the actual physical addresses the bus addresses of locations in memory. <coughs> so older computers, this was a direct operation, but in anything in the last probably three or four decades, it's a translation process. All right, so um, the address space, you can talk about it on either side. It's the set of all the addresses that some entity can uh, address. And for processes, they should be uh, completely distinct. 
as we said. So we have these two views, one from the CPU and one from memory, and the MMU is the entity that translates between them. And translation, as we said, provides both this distinct view and also protection. All right. Um, yeah, and I mean, translation, it just, among other things, it allows programs to be linked, loaded into uh, a, a contiguous block of actual physical space. Okay. All right, so <coughs> in traditional uni programming like MS-DOS, uh, this actually didn't happen, uh, which meant that code always had to be compiled into fixed physical addresses. Um, you could have, there were typically some services running at the same time, but it was necessary to put uh, system services, operating system services in a particular area of memory separate from the user space so that user space, user code and data wouldn't collide with them. Um, the application was allowed direct access to physical memory so it could directly access uh, the, the physical storage on the machine. <clears throat> so instead of that though, we want to give processes the view that they own everything. And let's try to do that in the simplest possible way, which is let's try to do it without translation. So if we're going to do that, then the operating system's going to have to do the separation at load or length time, most likely at load time. And we talked a little bit about this. The translation then involves typically relocation of instructions. So using the annotation in the assembly language file that says this is a relocatable um, instruction, you have to add, you know, the, a byte offset right shifted by four bits or something like that in order to get the correct relocated address. Um, and that was the method that was used in the early days of multiprocessing. And the downside is there's no protection. Uh, bugs can propagate, they can access code and, and they can probably also access the OS. <laughs> All right, so <coughs> A simple extension to this that it does support protection uh, is to add both uh, a base address to represent the offset of the application area, the application memory space, and then in addition a limit address, which says, so, so basically a base address plus a limit defines a range or a block in memory that a single process is allowed to run in. And in order to do it efficiently, you want to do this with some registers, base and limit uh, registers, and you know set them in code, and then when a single memory access uh, happens, it gets compared against two registers, which can happen very fast. Um, <coughs> so these data now, base address and limit address, have to be part of the, the description of the thread. They have to get swapped in and out when the thread gets switched swapped in and out, um, and th they have to be system managed. User code shouldn't be allowed to set them. Yeah? Why do you have to write two digits? Um, why, sorry, I'm not seeing, why do we avoid translation? I'm not sure why we're avoiding translation. Oh, I, oh, I see what you're saying. No, we're just setting things up. We're gradually introducing translation in terms of the description. Yeah, we're, we're going to do it. We're just sort of going one step at a time. Um, yeah, no, we're definitely going to do a lot more elaborate things in a minute. So, um, machines such as the Cray used a system like this. So, a virtual address came from the CPU. Uh, there was a, a base address that was added to it to get the, uh, an address in RAM. And it was also compared to some limit <coughs> in a register. If you exceeded that limit, it would throw an error. So uh, essentially a, a implemented in hardware, this would be a register, special register for the base, special register for the limit. And 
in very, very few instructions, possibly one instruction, all of this would happen. Okay. Um, because we're using a register for both limit and base, this is a very dynamic uh, a kind of address translation. And in fact, um, by loading different offsets into that register, say when we do a context switch, uh, we're able to move this piece of code around very rapidly. In fact, we can relocate it with every context switch. All right. Okay. We have error checking, so pretty good protection. Blocks, in theory, can only access their own code and data, um, not the code and data of some other process and not the code and, and data of the kernel. Okay. Yeah, so, so the relocation is now happening through this register, which uh, avoids the need for us to do re relocation, sort of rewriting of instructions like we were doing a little bit earlier. Okay. Um, most of the time, and you'll see this in uh, Nacho's, certainly in the next project, um, blocks of data and code and so on um, are often kept separate. You want, for instance, uh, stack and heap storage to be separate. Stack's normally growing, say, down, and then heap would be growing up. Um, other types of storage, let's say, might be shared. You might have some shared constants or some shared code. So a more flexible scheme has segments that have a few different types, not just one segment per process. Uh, so typically you'll have code, data, stack, and probably heap, uh, and other times different types of shared memory. So now we want to give those segments of, of storage a unique <coughs> mapping uh, into memory. We can use the same idea, some kind of base pointer and a limit register, and then allow each segment to independently live somewhere in memory. So there's four sort of virtual segments um, that the CPU can see, and we can map those um, into memory in, in an independent way. So Whereas here the processor may have its resources spread out in its address space, when we, re when we read that into memory, when we install that thread, we can pack them a bit more tightly so that there's more free storage for other processes. Okay, so let's look at this multi-segment model. Um, the idea now that the, the addresses that the CPU manipulates now you can divide them into two parts. The higher order bits form a segment address <coughs> or segment number, and then the lower order bits are an offset. Um, so uh, in order to do the mapping from each segment into physical memory, each segment number here indexes into a table, and the table contains both the limit and the base values and also typically um, a single bit that's a valid or invalid bit. What the valid invalid bit allows you to do is specify uh, a, a map or a pattern of memory that's not everything. It allows you to say that, uh, let's say, uh, this block of memory here is part of the process or it's not. Um, yeah, this is going to be a little bit more easy to explain when we get into uh, uh, page mapping, but um, basically not all of these uh, pages should automatically be valid. We want to allow the uh, process to say that I want to use these areas of memory and not these ones. The ones that it doesn't use will have this not valid flag. So um, the segment number is mapped to this base and limit pair, as we saw before. The base now is the real physical address in memory at the, the start of that segment. And the offset specifies an actual address in the segment. So you add those together, 
and <coughs> uh, compare the offset against the limit from this table. So the limit is specifying just how big the segment is. If your offset's bigger than that, it'll flag an error. Or if the offset's negative, it'll also flag an error. I guess if we're, yeah, we didn't talk about sign numbers, so it'll always be positive. Okay, so um, <coughs> now a, a disadvantage of this is that um, these entries are mapping uh, into physical memory and the segments are addressed by the portion of the virtual addresses. So this is going to get very large if you have large physical memory and even worse if you have large virtual memory. So um, a lot of processes including the x86 include uh, explicit offset or uh, segment addressing registers. And this is a segment addressing register in, in red. So the segment ad addressing register allows you to uh, once again implement this with an instruction versus using a series of instructions to read in these um, offsets and limits and execute uh, code perhaps in software. So there are hardware accelerations of those operations. All right, and valid, invalid, uh, we talked a, a little bit about. Um, those get checked when you do a lookup to see if the area you want to look at is actually valid or not. That is, uh, is a segment. So a segment is just some bits of your address. All right, so um, normally this table is going to include every possible combination of those bits. So let's say you had a three-bit segment address. You'd need eight elements of this table, which is what we have. Um, but you may have specified that, let's say, only the first three out of eight of those segments are actually part of the addressable virtual memory. Um, the next block is simply not supposed to be addressed. In other words, you've set a, a constraint on your processor's memory because it's you've allocated all it needs here. You don't want it to run and consume more memory than you expect it to. So this would then provide a kind of a segmentation fault check. Yeah? Um, so the question was, what is the x86 example? That was an example of basically hardware support for this kind of process, where the base address is in this um, so this a special register in x86, which is for segment addressing. So um, the instructions that use that typically support uh, basically adding, let's see, yeah, adding this as an offset to an actual address and then addressing that. Um, yeah. So it's just a way of making those steps uh, go faster. Um, all right, so. Uh, another example of this quickly, uh, let's say that we have four segments. Again, code, data, some shared memory, and, and some stack. Um, <coughs> here's the con con contents of the segment table include some base addresses, which would refer to physical memory here, and then some limits, which are constraining the size of those segments. And let's say here are some virtual uh, addresses. So here we're trying to address a block of, of virtual memory from the CPU. <coughs> the address is just zero, which means the segment ID is zero. <coughs> if you look up here, the segment ID is just the top three bits of the address. So it really is zero there. The segment uh, mapping table is addressed first by the, that segment ID, which is zero. It has a physical memory base address of um, a hex 4,000. So your segment's being mapped into this base address of 4,000. And then it has a limit or a size of 800. So this sort of logical block in virtual memory is being mapped to this physical block at 4,000. 
So the base tells you where it starts, the limit tells you how far it goes. Um, the next segment <coughs> with ID 1, uh, let's see, it's, it's 1, so I'd have to, it's 1 because there are 12 bits uh, before the 1 associated with the 4 if you right shift that, in other, in other words, if you right shift that 12 bits, which is the offset size, uh, you get 1, so it's segment ID is 1. The base address of segment 1 is 4800, so the base address of this segment is here, right after the previous segment, and its limit is uh, hex 1400, and when you add that to 4800, it's 5C00. So you get the idea, hopefully. Um, the uh, by using the base and the limit, you get a range such that um, when addresses come in, they'll be checked. They'll be mapped, first of all, but they'll also be checked. And if they fall out of the range, it's going to throw an exception. Yeah? All right. So, um, so there's uh, um, a few different ways of doing it. it. It can be stored. In the early days, there was some hardware support, and there are enough registers in the older 80, 8086s to put this in a register, and there's advantages to doing that. But these days, um, because segment, segmenting is combined with uh, uh, paging, it's not done. It's normally, uh, it's a kind of complicated answer. Generally, the, the complete tables will be in memory that we'll see in the rest of this lecture, um, except that there's a, a cache uh, which is the, the TLB, which we'll talk about last time, which has a, typically a hardware implementation in the CPU. So logically, um, they're being stored in memory, but they do have a cache in the CPU that's accelerating the process. They're these days too big and complicated to be impl implemented in a few registers like these could be. So, so the answer is uh, notionally, they're normally data structures that are stored themselves in memory, um, but re rely typically on a custom cache, the TLB, to accelerate their accesses. So, um, actually, um, they're part of the process state, but it's the PCB, uh, I yeah, the PCB normally wouldn't con contain an, an entire mapping structure. It would be too big. Um, the PCB, if you needed to uh, save the state of a, an entire translation table, you'd probably have to save it to disk separately. Um, the, the, the normal mode of running is that you'll have your page tables for running processes already resident in memory so that when you swap a process back in, you don't have to move a large amount of memory off of disk. I suppose there's nowhere else to put it. So the, the, the page tables, especially the part of the page tables that are being um, actively used, uh, should be in memory. So there are ways of actually moving parts of them out of memory into disk. If you're not using part of a page table, uh, it probably will get, it will probably not be in memory. But I think you can get the idea it's a complicated process that that uh, will be much better to talk about next time when we get more deeply into caching the, uh, the page table. All right, so the, sim the simple segmentation has uh, a number of issues. Let's see. Um, so fragmentation is one. You can see that uh, <coughs> As I add processes and remove them, I create holes in memory, as with any other allocation task. And sooner or later, I'll get uh, a problem of not being able to fit something in memory. The segmentation we've described allows arbitrarily large chunks of memory, and that can lead to arbitrary bad fragmentation. Um, <clears throat> all right. So, um, yeah, so we Actually, this is partly answering your question. Uh, so, yeah, so moving some or all of the process to disk uh, 
which basically mo means moving its memory uh, along with its paging, page, page table structures. Uh, I suppose another way to think about it is that the page table structures are a little bit like the directory data in a, a disk file. Um, if you move the disk, or if you move a file, you normally want to move the sort of block directory of the file. It sort of go, all goes together. There's not a lot of sense to sort of moving the memory without the directory or moving the directory without the, the data, if that makes sense. So swapping out uh, a process, which means swapping out uh, all of the memory associated with the process normally would go along with moving out the page translation tables. So maybe that's a better answer to the question. Uh, anyway, so ideally what you'd like to do is only swap out the parts that you don't need. Um, but anyway, that's a, a part of memory allocation, which is something that's also coming later. So I better move a little bit more quickly because I'm going to run out of time. So we already described these problems such as fragmentation, um, inability to fit everything. So um, after the administrative year, we'll get back to uh, uh, paging, which is a way to provide smaller chunks, smaller sort of mappable chunks of data that will support segmentation, but also do a lot more efficient use of memory. OK, so for now, <coughs> um, reminders. Uh, project One code is due Tuesday, October 8th by midnight. Um, the design docs are due the following night. <coughs> uh, here are the midterm rooms again. Uh, it's a closed book we exam. You shouldn't use notes or uh, calculators, smartphones, Google Glass, cognitive implants, uh, other prostheses. Um, but you can take one handwritten page of notes. Yeah. I, bl I thought it was one-sided. Isn't that right? It was two. All right. Well, it's two then. <laughs> All right. OK, so um, one handwritten page. All right, OK. Um, <clears throat> all right, covering material up to, uh, I think, the Wednesday before uh, the midterm. We do have a review session scheduled in Hearst Mining um, the Friday before the exam. OK, so please try to attend that. All right, um, OK, so all right, five-minute break. And we'll try to finish up after that. Yes, no worries. Oops, sorry. Hang on a sec. Uh, oh, I went too far, sorry. All right.
All right, let's uh, try to wrap up. So the solution that we're going to talk about now is paging, which means um, instead of trying to allocate these huge segments of different sizes and manage them, we're going to break memory up into fixed size fragments, fixed size for now anyway, um, called pages. Uh, so you could, if you have fixed size chunks, um, one observation you can make right away is that you can think of the allocated set of pages as being describable with a bitmap. So in other words, make a long list of them for every a page that's part of the process's allocation, you could assign a one. Things that are not part of the process of allocation would be assigned a zero. So this is a very efficient kind of a page table which just says here are the elements that you're allowed to address. And in fact that is used never by itself but in more complicated um, page representation schemes. So um, when we were talking before about segments, we were talking about segments that were big enough to hold an entire set of data, probably mega, many megabytes, or an entire um, program. But that's going to cause the, prob the problems that we had before, which are you know, these massive chunks. We won't be able to fit ma many of them in memory, and they'll cause fragmentation. With paging, instead, we choose blocks that are um, small enough that they small enough and a similar size that we can allocate and reallocate lots of them without really having fragmentation, but also large enough that the overhead of keeping track of them uh, doesn't become too large. It doesn't dominate memory. All right, and that's what uh, the paging approach is. You'll choose chunks typically in the range of about 1K to 16K kilobytes, and um, then you'll still have to have tables, but there are clever ways of manipulating tables to those pages that are themselves pretty economical and basically where the size of the paging structure is proportional to the size of the memory that you're using. So <coughs> um, here's a simple page table. It's similar to the segment tables that we looked at before. So there's a page table pointer. It's addressing some number of pages. Here though, um, instead of uh, a, a base address, you'll have a page number, which is typically, in order to get a physical address, you multiply by the size of the pages. <coughs> um, the page table normally resides in physical memory, although it might be cached. Um, and it will contain permissions again of the type we had for segments, um, and also valid read, valid bits as well to say whether uh, that page is usable currently by that process. So <clears throat> um, a virtual address here, now we have a page number instead of a segment number, and an offset, and the virtual page number is going to index into that table. The offset will add later. <clears throat> uh, so a virtual, virtual page will give us, um, let's say if it's one, we'll access page one, now, um, page one is going to be some physical page address like 17 or 300 or something. Those bits of that address are then appended in front of the offset. So you can see that the um, physical page address here is effectively shifted by the number of bits in the offset. So it's, not, uh, it's a bit different from the offsets that we saw before. Um, <coughs> okay, so. Uh, yeah, and, and here this is a simple model where basically we're just preserving all of the offset bits and replacing the virtual page bits with physical page bits. So this is a simple table-based translation of that address there into a physical address. All right, we can also include, um, actually in at least two places, uh, a page table size bound. Um, here, we probably aren't going to use uh, an offset bound as often because the pages are small. We're more likely to be concerned about a virtual page address straying outside of the boundary. So it's more reasonable to check this page table size going out of bounds. Does that make sense? Anyway, that's commonly done. We'll do a, a, a page table size check here to make sure that we're in bounds 
for that particular process. Okay, now um, this approach uh, does allow us to share memory if we have a couple of processes, each with distinct page tables. <coughs> The, the actual physical page, page addresses can be shared, and that gives us a way for the two processes to access either shared constant memory or uh, shared data memory if they're going to communicate. All right, so, um, and just going a little bit, drilling a little bit deeper, here's an example um, of three uh, pages of virtual memory being translated into physical memory. These are tiny pages with four bytes each. Um, a, B, C, D, F, G, those are alphabetic labels, not addresses in hex. And you can see that here in the virtual address space, we have basically three blocks of four objects each, four bytes each. Um, that's the page table size. So each of these addresses, I suppose implicitly, addresses an entry in the page table. So the page table has to contain an entry for all of the addressable virtual memory. So here it's only three. Uh, and it's mapping from each of these physical addresses, which are uh, right shifted by two bits, because it's a four byte page, into 0, 1, 2. So it's 0, 4, 8. Um, because the page size is four, you've got to shift away the offset effectively, and then your page number 0, 1, 2. Is that clear? From there, you can just look up a new page number, which is 431, <coughs> and append the new page number. Uh, here it is here. It's uh, 100 in front of the two bit offset. And you get this entry here. So that segment's going to map into a physical memory at address uh, hex 10. And similarly for the other one, it's going to map uh, the address is 3. When you append the 3 in front of the offset, the original offset, you get uh, hex C. And so that block's now above the other block, and the third block's going to address up here. So you've got independent now locations for these three pages. Yeah? Uh, well, you've got a, it's n no special reason. Uh, why did we choose two, two bytes? Well, we actually chose four bytes, which means that the address, the, the number of bits we have to use to address within a page is two. It's a four byte page. The number of bits you need to address the page is the log to the base two of the number of bytes in the page. So if it's a 1K byte page, it would be 10 bits. Here it's only four, so we need two bits. So the, the two bits of the address are in black, and then the rest is actually a page address. <coughs> um, so, so four goes to one, and eight goes to two, and so on. So essentially, you strip away the um, address within the page. You're left with just the page number. That goes into this table, which is a complete table, should be, for all possible page addresses. And then it just takes you somewhere else in memory. But you do the same thing with this address here, which is you appended in front of the actual within page address. OK. Um, <clears throat> so on context switching, the idea is to do the minimum amount of work. So to me, that, that means not trying to switch the table, simply trying to switch the pointer and potentially the limit so that um, you know process A goes out and process B comes in. Process B will have its own uh, page table pointer and uh, limit in its process control block. And we'll assume that that table is still in memory. And then all it, all it, it'll just keep on going, because the state should be the same as from before. All right, so um, advantages of this, it's a simple allocation scheme and easy to share. Um, but big problems with large address spaces. Um, so you know, this scheme, because we have an entry for every page, with a large address space, you'll need millions of entries. So uh, 
So there is a solution to this, and I think we're going to run out of time. Uh, I'll just introduce it, and we'll have to complete it next time. So uh, one elegant approach is to use a tree of tables, um, and the tree is a sparse structure that only contains entries for the uh, actually valid pages in the page table. And in fact, we'll often use the, the most economical at the bottom of the table, which is sort of the lowest order address, we'll use the simple bitmap representation of the page table, which just means some pages are in, some pages are out. Um, so here's the idea. <coughs> we have the virtual ad address here, the CPU's view of the world. Um, some of the bits form the first virtual segment, um, and the second is the second part of the virtual page. and uh, those are used together with two different tables. Um, in fact, here with this, the first one serving as a segment uh, table. So this one has segment data, which is a base and a limit. That then accesses into uh, a separate page table for each segment and includes the, the bits specific to that page. So. Um, the segment plus the virtual page are translated into a, a physical page and an offset, and that's the, uh, the physical address. So this, with this scheme, um, it's possible now to still do the same kind of things we were doing with segments before, but we have the additional flexibility in that the segments don't have to be allocated as contiguous blocks in memory. Um, each segment can be comprised of many different fragments or pages that are distributed through, but using up most of physical memory. Um, yeah, we'll still have the same kind of checks as we did last time. All right, so, <clears throat> okay, so we're out of time. We do have next lecture uh, is gonna get more into address translation anyway, so we'll just take, pick it up from where we leave off here next time.